Please consider becoming a patron of Myth Vision Podcast. You'll get early access to every video, including this amazing one. And you can ask me personal questions, private message me, anything you'd like. Professor James D. Tabor, we have done amazing recording so far, and I thought, oh, we'll just fly through all these and do 10, 15 minutes. Let me stop with my expectations, because I'll have to either reset a new date on which time I'm going to get this done, or I'll have to spiritualize our conversations to say <laughs> they've been fulfilled. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what did Paul think of himself as? He's... He seems to say he was chosen before the other apostles, kind of like, and he fits this prophet role. But also you said in another video, he kind of is a, another Christ and he's filling up the suffering of Christ. Like he's, there's still more Christ didn't get done that he requires Paul to do. So tell us about Paul, what he thinks of himself and some of the crazy stuff that we might yeah. get into. Yeah, I cover it mostly in the Paul and Jesus book, um, I do have a section on that. Well, let's start with uh, being called in your mother's womb. It's a very unique expression. In the New Testament, we certainly would see that for John the Baptist, at least according to Luke, because he has chapter one is all about John the Baptist before he's born. And finally he's born, and so you could say he was called and According to Luke, Jesus is called and in the womb. Most Christians go with something about whether it's the virgin birth, literally or what. But they'd say, yeah, when Jesus was developing in Mary's womb, he was already called, destined. So Paul, and the only other person in the Bible that that is said of, is um, Jeremiah. And, and he doesn't say it. God says it to him in chapter 1 of Jeremiah. He said, when you were in the womb, I knew you and appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now notice, a prophet to the nations. We tend to think of Jeremiah as a prophet to Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, because that's who he spoke to or against. But Je the best parallel to Jesus is Jeremiah. He's before the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem in 586 or 587, as some think. And he's being told as a young man, he's called a young man when, he, when he's called, uh, I, I chose you before you've been born. So it's a pretty heady mission to be told you, and you got a mission to go to the nations. Uh, now, in Galatians 1, Paul says, God or the Lord who called me when I was in my mother's womb. You're thinking, wait a minute, is that just hyperbole or what? Because you didn't have your conversion, as people sometimes call it. I don't think that's a very appropriate word because we tend to use it for changing religions. But you didn't come to your conviction that the crucified Jesus was, in fact, the exalted Messiah, uh, glorified at the right hand of God, da, da, da. You know, you didn't come to that till later. So what do you mean called from the womb? He's clearly saying... I'm the new Jeremiah. I was called from the womb, and I'm also going to go to the nations. The nations, not primarily to Israel, even though he's Jewish. And so uh, I opened my Bible here. Uh, yeah, usually I can just quote some things here, but I want to read you something that uh, was just going to surprise you, I think, if you've never thought of it. I'm going to read you a text where somebody's speaking in the first person, and I'm going to ask you to imagine that it's Paul. Okay. So I'm Paul reading this to you, and I'm trying to explain my mission. And I say, Derek, you know, with all the humility in the world, I think I've found my mission mentioned. And I hesitate to even tell you this, because it's so monumental and I'm so unworthy of it. But let me 
read it. This is Isaiah 49. The Lord called me in the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me like a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. I feel that refers to my upbringing. Right now, I have the sword of the Spirit and I'm out, but I was, no, but I didn't know my mission. And he said to me, You're my servant, Israel, in whom I'll be glorified. And now the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him, that my salvation will reach to the nations and to the end of the earth and so forth. And then he talks about suffering to one deeply despised, abhorred, abhorred rather, not abhorred, abhorred by the nations and so forth. I think Paul identified with that text. Now, some say Jesus did too. He might have. But Jesus didn't go to the nations. And if you read the entire chapter, it sounds like somebody who is sent to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Because he says, I've appointed you to Israel. But it goes on to say, oh, is it a light thing that you've got to uh, go to Israel? Is that tough? Guess what? I'm also going to send you to the nations. And I think Paul saw himself as fulfilling a double mission. So he's a Jew, like Jesus, uh, a kind of a second Christ, and I'm using the small c, but not the way people use it now as the last name of Jesus Christ, capital. <laughs> but he's anointed, anointed, appointed, anointed by the Spirit. And he is to preach to the Jews, and he always did. He would go in the synagogue and preach it, but then to the Gentiles, that Israel might be gathered. And here, I think he does have an idea that by gathering the Gentiles, he's also bringing in the fullness, what's, what he calls the fullness of the Gentiles, so that all Israel will be saved. Now, as you know, I think you've interviewed Jason Staples, who mm-hmm. is Bart Ehrman's student. And he's written articles, and I don't know, is his book out yet on his this? His first one is. is out. Not on this. Not, yeah, but... The word is out. I think he's done some interviews, but I've read it. Yeah, I have his dissertation. I think it maybe it was online or maybe he sent it to me. But anyway, it, it's really an amazing argument that he makes. I didn't uh, put it in my book because I didn't want to usurp his work until it came out. I wanted to put it in in the sense, and I could have said, well, Jason Staples did a And I just decided, you know, the book has so many other things that I've developed, and this is actually his idea. And it just gripped me from the beginning. I think Bart also is saying, sort of leaning that this is true. I tried to get Bart to say what was wrong with it. And he said, well, I I helped with this project. So he's like, I can't say. Well, I've heard him even say that he thinks that, Probably, you know, probably. I mean, yeah. So, what is the basic point? What is the point? Yeah. Forget racism, ethnic DNA. Like, oh, somebody's got the Y chromosome from Abraham. It, it, this isn't. First of all, you have to understand the Abraham stuff as Paul reads it. Who, if you read Genesis 18, when Abraham is dialoguing with God about Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, God says to himself, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? No, I'm going to let him know because he's going to teach his, his seed and his household justice and righteousness. So you have always had this idea of <coughs> the literal seed of Abraham and the household of Abraham, which is the household of faith. Paul likes that. Because it doesn't mean we give you a DNA test at the door to see if you go back to Abraham. (coughs) Excuse me. What it means is, if you're attracted to the gospel, called, as Paul says, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. (coughs) If you're called, then God is choosing you. If you read in Romans those whom he has predestined, uh, which literally, that's a bad word because of the Calvinists, who, ha, who has <clears throat> predestined, 
pro orizo, who is appointed before him. He's appointed before him, just like Paul was called before him. Mm -hmm. So those who he has appointed before him, uh, he calls. And those he calls, he justifies. And those he justifies, he glorifies. That's the plan. It's the elect group. Then you go, well, I want to be elect, or why am I not elect? <clears throat> then you get to Romans 9 through 11. At this point in history, he's strategically only pulling certain ones in that in some way were declared not my people, Hosea chapter 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. and those were the Israelites that went into exile. They've intermingled with the nations, but when they come back, I think they bring the nations with them. It's not like you find one and say, oh, well, you're the real Abraham seed and your buddy there can come too because he likes you and you believe in the one God. Or the, Paul's not thinking that. But he does, Jason points out, he uses this term that's used in Genesis about the fullness of Israel. Genesis 49, yeah. I think when he says Ephraim seed will be a multitude of nations. Yeah. You're talking about? Yeah. And here he references that same... Paul so all Israel it. will finally be saved, meaning God... The whole point is he's got to fulfill his promises. So See? let me probe a few things I think are important. So that's Paul's mission. Right. Now, the suffering we can wait on. But well, uh, yeah, I just... Well, part saying. of it, the fill up the suffering is in Colossians. So you could maybe throw it out. Yeah. But I think it's kind of Pauline thinking. Remember, the Deutero-Pauline stuff is not like throw it in the trash. No. We have to be careful because it has good stuff. It has, you know... It has Pauline ideas yeah, probably sometimes. taught to people who followed him. Exactly. But I was going to mention... But I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to be poured out on the altar the sacrificial altar of your faith. These are texts right. in genuine Paul. So he believes that like Christ, he has to suffer. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm going to the cross, folks. And he names all his sufferings. And he tells them they got to do it too. And Jesus told them they got to do it too. Right. Remember, he said, if you want to follow me, there you go. So, you know, so I do think, but he does think that the redeem the stage two of the redemption, this is stage two, that will prepare for the parousia. This is this is not all of humanity. Right. Stage two of the parousia is the new reconstituted Israel is going to be glorified. And yeah, it'll seem like they're quote Gentiles because they became not my people. So but this is important to just bring up is that Paul identifies himself as a Jeremiah, so to speak. He, he's looking at Jeremiah as if Jeremiah is actually talking about him. <laughs> but um, Jeremiah was a prophet to the nations, but he's constantly talking about to Israel. The lost tribes. Right. See, to him, the, remember, he, he knows Hosea's idea because that's earlier. They're not my people. So when he's preaching that the exodus to come, I call it exodus 2, this is Jeremiah 31, and the new covenant, which is a new marriage, covenant is marriage, God says, although I was a husband to them, so what's the new covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31, it's with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, it's all of Israel back together in the land, mm -hmm. now Paul probably took it much more spiritually or symbolically, like when he brought the gifts up in a way they're like they don't have to move to the land and set up a theocracy because he believes in a cosmic transformation. So I'm not saying he's just like a literal. That's and yeah. I love this. Yeah. You're doing great because it makes me want to say in short, simple terms, because definitions help. Paul has a broadened understanding of Israel. Yes. In a way that still lets the promises be fulfilled. But Abraham did too. Remember, he circumcised his entire household. Remember that? He circumcised his entire household. So they're now, they can eat the Passover, so to speak. They can eat, you know, they're part of it. So this just says outsiders could join. Outsiders could join and outsiders did join. And then what about Isaiah 56, which is the house of prayer for all people? Mm -hmm. And I will gather to him others than are gathered. And that's sort of convoluted, but when you see where it is, Isaiah 56 talks all the time about everybody coming back. And then I will gather others, Jesus and John, other sheep I have that are not of this fold and so forth. So uh, I think Jason's really onto something. He has many more ideas that uh, 
work with this and go further. I know he has two more. One book is out and he has another book coming. I think he's just really uh, opening up some things that are so important. I think so too. And I think it couples with what 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 I've said as well. Oh yeah. In terms of Paul's mission, Paul's mission is to bring the redemption. You say, well, Jesus' mission, yeah, but he didn't do it. Jesus didn't bring the redemption. Jesus inaugurated the redemption. Paul is now finishing it. Stage two. Stage three is more vague. Would you agree with Paula Fredrickson where, where it's the idea that, well, it didn't happen yet. Uh, the earliest possible movement of Jesus' followers and the disciples are going, it didn't happen yet. And Paul's taking it upon himself going, we need to get the nations. Uh, he feels called to get the nations because we see, well, it's almost like if you and me were to read Genesis and we know there's 50 chapters and we're looking at this going, well, this is supposed to end. But in this book, I could find other things that didn't seem like they happen here. Mm -hmm. Let's fulfill these prophecies in the last days. The lost tribes was supposed to come mm -hmm. back, which is part of the theme. Mm -hmm. But also that the nations, like you talk about with these they quotes, come, yeah. Isaiah 2, yeah. Isaiah 11, right. you know, Isaiah 66. We, Isaiah's big on this, but mm -hmm. also yeah. Jeremiah does this mm -hmm. in other other books. But um, Jeremiah 3 said it'll rival the Exodus when it happens. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. and it's like he's trying to make it get fulfilled. Yeah. So do you think Paul Fred on something with that she's like it's in stages like you talk about but the stages are also saying well the first stage we thought it was going to happen then but mm -hmm. we have a second stage we need to make sure it happens then the end isn't quite I haven't yet. read th that book I read when Christians were Jews and I, and I know of course her Jesus of Nazareth book I reviewed so um, so I'm not sure exactly what she's saying uh, let me tell you what what I think might be going on and maybe it will parallel I would say the James Jerusalem people are expecting things much more politically and literally. And so they would maybe feel that there's a parallel with Paul going out and gathering these people. And here they are. They used to worship idols and they go, no, I believe in the living God like Titus. And I've given up fornication and I'm trying to live a holy life and so forth. And uh, but some of the group would think, well, if you're fully Israelite, you know, come on in the tent. You know, you're welcome to be our associates, but don't you want to be part of the inner family, too? Mm -hmm. That could have been part of the thing. But I am thinking, I mean, I just don't know. Maybe James is just as cosmic as Paul, because I, I think the letter of James is Jamesian, you know, in that sense, it it does give us a sort of different view of Christianity or the movement. But it does, it, I'm not so sure if it's giving us what the historical James thought, say, in 40. If you said, like, what do you think the next 20 years will bring, James? Would you, what did you and your brother think? I think he would have pretty well thought, well, you know, these legions that are occupying the country, they're going to be gone. Right. I probably thought armies from heaven or whatever is going to help. Probably like Qumran. I would think it'd be Eisenman here. I would go with. I don't know that you know James is part of the Qumran group. I haven't become convinced of that. But where Eisenman is really good, and people need to recognize this, is that he's identified a piety, a kind of faith and approach, a messy, what he calls the messianic movement in Palestine, that does not start with Jesus, and Jesus might be part of it, but. You know, we know from the scrolls and it's got a whole vocabulary, a whole way of talking about righteousness and justice and so forth. And it's it's fully political. Now, with God on our side, you know, not like, oh, let's just, you know, we'll have we'll spend more on arms than they will. And not like the United States, you know, beating up Russia in the Cold War. But it's certainly not pie in the sky or just somehow. The Romans will just, no, the Romans are going to get defeated. Maybe it'll be Zechariah 14. Do you remember Zechariah 14? Mm -hmm. Right when they're ready to surround the country, all of a sudden their flesh just melts. Last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark, he got it right out of Zechariah. These Nazis, they go. <laughs> so maybe he's expecting something like that. It's Zechariah 14, final battle. So they saw Jerusalem surrounded by armies. They thought probably, oh, wow. This, of course, he was dead then. He didn't get to see it. Uh, but Paul, I don't know that Paul 
he's he's a Jerusalem above guy. I don't think he thought. I don't think he cared what happened to the city. I don't think he, he didn't love to see it destroyed, but I don't think he particularly thought, oh, we're all going to go back there and be farming in the Galilee. Or he says, no, we're going to be on a new creation. There'll be no more decay, no more death. He's transcendent. He's gone into what Christians generally say today. Right. You know, shorthand, you die and go to heaven. Now that's skipping everything, but yeah. they kind of mean that. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Is that platonic, you think? Oh, absolutely. Dualistic platonic. And do you think Paul picked that up from that culture? Well, it's, he didn't just pick. It's just in the air. Yeah, and that's why I thought the whole Eucharist thing, and I don't want to go back there because we already did an episode on it, but I feel like that might have been picked up in the Greco-Roman world in some sense. Uh, Possibly, here. but that refers to very specific <coughs> rituals among certain kinds of mystery religions and so forth. But there's a, a sentiment there, yeah. But the thing is, Jonathan Smith was my teacher at Chicago, dissertation director, and all the scholars will know who I'm talking about. He's just, I think he's the most br brilliant historian of religions of our time. And he used to say, he's Jewish, and he used to say, uh, you know, don't talk about Hellenized Judaism. There's no religion of the Hellenistic period that's not Hellenized. They're all Hellenized. And by that, uh, you know, he's talking about their, they have a diaspora. They're, they're not locative anymore. Like we got this city, it's the holy city. This is going to be it. You know, they're, uh, they're becoming utopian. They're worried about death and immortality and, you know, big questions. God's becoming cosmopolitan. Yeah, exactly. Even like, how are demons going to get defeated finally forever? <laughs> we haven't talked about that, but yeah, like, Remember, Paul says the big thing that we have to conquer are the principalities and powers. We act like we've de demythologized this and that doesn't even exist. As Frank uh, Moore Cross said once, he was interviewing with Herschel Shanks, he said, I was raised Presbyterian and you couldn't even swing a cat around without hitting a few demons, which is not a great analogy <laughs> for cat lovers, but, you know, he's a Southerner. But he was just saying, like, we, we act like the world was a sterile scientific place. No, if my car won't start right now when I go home, Satan, Satan hindered me. Yep. And there are people that live like that today, as Paul. you know. Don't you know Christians that live I like that? I used to do that. That whatever happens, is, and then maybe it was for a reason, because all things work together for good <laughs> to those who know. So you were going to be in a car wreck, but God save you. And then you try it again, and it's like, wow, thank you, Jesus. You know, yeah, everything. not making fun of it again. I'm just... Actually, that's a good thing to know, because if you want to imagine what they're living in, With it's Paul, that worldview. And Paul does that, Paul. The Satan and not just Paul, me. probably James and all the rest of them. I There's think no all, telling where that the demonology. The Talmud is full of it. The Mishnah is full of it. It's a cool thing to know, though. From I have actual personal experience from that, and that, yeah. that that's cool to kind of look back and go, Paul. Paul, he's not much different than us when it comes to this. No, uh, he, he was a fundamentalist. I had sense. dreams. Yeah. I had dreams of the end, mm -hmm. Doctor Tabor. I had real dreams. I had two dreams. I'll never forget them. I've had plenty of dreams in my life, just like you. But one of the dreams was I was standing in a field. A girl I grew up with uh, that lived right around the corner was standing there, and I looked over, and there was fire. The whole heavens turned to fire. And I looked, and the fire was coming down to earth, and it started way off in the distance coming closer to me. So it was a warning. And it was coming to me, and I went, I went, uh, Jesus. She went, what the hell is what she said? And I went, Jesus. And I closed my eyes, and I woke up, and there's this guy writing this big book with a feather pen. <laughs> and he's like, everything's going to be okay, Derek. Okay. And then. So you got my, a revelation. Yeah. Right, in my dream. And then I had another dream where. Uh, I was sitting on the front porch, thunderstorms and lightning, and I liked watching it, but it's kind of scary at the same time. It's it's sure. peaceful. And the lightning bolt struck me in mm -hmm. my, my bosom, if I could use the term, my belly. Mm -hmm. And it started to suck me up like it was attached to me. And I looked across the sky and all these people were floating up with electric mm -hmm. lightning bolts, you know, attached to them, mm -hmm. pulling them up under the sky. And it, the rapture is what I kept thinking. And so... I literally experience these things. Mm -hmm. I have other reasons why I, my approach to them, I take more of a natural approach yeah. to things yeah. these days, but I took it that serious. So I can mm -hmm. kind of imagine that Paul yeah. living in a world where Rome and the world around and him is And demons starting. especially. 
for example, he says in Second Corinthians 2, uh, if they had known who Jesus was, the powers that be, they wouldn't have crucified him. As they got tricked, said they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Because by killing him, they started the suffering glorification process for the cosmos. They, mm -hmm. But if they'd known that, they got, no, don't crucify him. Let's get him another way. Maybe make him sin or something. But they got, no, let's just kill him. Now, these are the powers. This is Second Corinthians 2, I think verse 8 or so. So, yeah, he's completely into this sort of thing. Completely. And it's not either or. It's kind of... Sickness. The... Uh, he talks about his thorn in the flesh. Um, Wouldn't you agree, though? The the, It's not either or. Because there's mythicists, for example, who will say demons are all that crucified him in the heavens. There yeah. were no human activity involved sure. in Jesus' crucifixion. Right. But Paul isn't saying that either. It's like... It's like the Christian down the street. And Islam sees... says he wasn't even crucified. It was a body double. <laughs> right. Yeah. But like, it, it, mm -hmm. it's one of those things. It's like the car won't start down the street. Um, Satan did it. But imagine some guy snipped the battery. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you got to kind of go, well, was it demons? Well, yeah, I'm blaming the demons. But really that guy down the street's the one who snipped my battery and why it won't start. But Satan's got it out for me. And you're like, but the guy did that. Well, the demon caused the guy to do it. Right. And <laughs> is that what you're saying? You think Paul's doing with the Romans and the Jews? Or is it, does Paul blame he just, the Jews? He just believes in a cosmos that's like thickly populated with all these forces. And to have cosmic redemption and salvation, they have to be conquered. Whatever that means, he used the term conquered. Mm. Put down, brought into subjection. And he says, when all things are under his feet, God the Father has given him this job to put down all things cosmically. One of the things he's going to do is eliminate decay from the whole cosmos. Mm -hmm. For example, he says, he will change our lowly bodies like his glorious body. Did you notice? Like his glorious body, Christ's glorious body. So by the power which enables him to subject all things to himself. So Christ is the one that's doing this glorification thing. God gave him the power to do this. And you then, once you're glorified, you're going to share in this power. He calls Christians joint heirs with the Messiah. That doesn't just mean like, oh, Jesus likes me. I guess I'm his friend. That means you are going to get exalted above every rule, authority, and power in the whole universe with God in this new cosmic family. And that's Paul's greatest idea, as I say in the book. And uh, most people haven't really noticed that, but it really, it's all over the place once you see it. You just can't read Paul with, oh, there it is, there it is, there it is. So. Thank you.